Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. My name is Katie Lamke. I'm a conservation biologist with the Xerces Society based in Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, my main role at Xerces is to coordinate the Bumblebee Atlas effort running in the Midwest. We're now in seven states in the Midwest, which is amazing. Um, my colleague Genevieve P. Jessic is also here with us tonight. She's a new conservation biologist with Xerces and will be helping to coordinate the Midwest Atlas as well. Steve Bubak is on with the Missouri Department of Conservation, and he will tell us a little bit about some of the plant data that has been collected over the past couple of years, mostly with a focus on Missouri, but you know, many of the plants in that state will also apply to Nebraska. Uh, Dr. Debbie Finke and her graduate student, Jared Braben, are on tonight from the University of Missouri. And we'll also hear from Jared tonight, who will kind of go through some bumblebee identification and give us his perspective on how he identifies some bumblebees in the area. And Brett Anderson is also here with us from the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. So really wonderful to have so many partners on this call tonight. Um, thanks to all of you who have showed up tonight and are gonna sit with us this evening. Um, it's really nice to see so many familiar names. I know a lot of you have been in these projects for now two, three, four years. So thank you for coming back. Um, Tonight, we're going to mostly focus on looking at the data that we've collected in the past couple of years and where we're going starting this year and beyond. If you missed the first part of the training that took place in mid-April, um, you're welcome to go and watch that via YouTube. Um, there is a link that we can send out to that one. It's the Xerces Society YouTube channel. Um, that first part of the training covers bumblebee ecology, bumblebee biology, some of the conservation efforts that are going on to help support these species. It goes into threats and decline factors that are impacting bumblebees and just sort of sets a really nice stage for the purpose of these Atlas projects and why getting involved can have such a large impact. So again, if you want to rewatch that, you can go to the Xerces YouTube channel and we are recording this one tonight. If you have to hop off early for any reason, it will be shared around. So jumping into tonight's content, let's see if the slide wants to move for me. Here we go. So the Bumblebee Atlas is a large and growing network, right? The first one launched in 2018 in the Pacific Northwest. And each year since then, we've grown to a new state or a new region um, and started up another project. You can see from the partners that are on the call tonight, as well as all the logos on the screen, um, Xerces does not work alone to make these projects a success. You know, it takes all the volunteers, but it also takes funding and support from state agencies and federal agencies. So having everybody around and supporting these projects is really, really wonderful. And we're, you know, excited to keep growing. We have more plans to grow in 2024. So this work is very valuable. It's lending a lot of insight. Um, so if you're here and you've been here for multiple years, thank you very much for participating. Again, these projects are establishing baseline data sets for us. So when we think about everything that we know about, let's say mammals or birds, you know, we disproportionately know a lot more about those species because so many people have been studying them for so many years. Um, they're probably a lot easier to study than flying insects that are only out for half of the year, but we don't know very much about bumblebees. So these Atlas projects are a really, really nice way to just establish baseline data sets, right? Ask some of those simple questions. What bumblebees are in Nebraska? What bumblebees are plants using in Missouri? How do those plant preferences change from June through September? How does it change based on habitat type of the state? what kind of nesting features are found in these habitat types. So just these simple questions that let us know how bumblebees are interacting with the landscape allows us to make evidence-based recommendations, right? So when we go to put a pollinator seed mix on the ground or we're thinking about managing habitat in a way that will support bumblebees, understanding how these organisms interact with the landscape 
is going to let us do that, right? We need to know that information before we can make sound decisions. So the Atlas engages people like all of you and so many more to help us collect that data. And you can see here in this graph, this is showing Bumblebee Watch, which is where all of the data is submitted. It's sort of like eBird if you've never used it before, but I think most of you on here have by now. Um, so this graph is showing observations that have been submitted to Bumblebee Watch since inception. So Bumblebee Watch launched in 2014, and you can see the bars go all the way up until the end of last year. And in 2018, when you see that big jump in observations, that's when the first Atlas project was launched. And you can see each year after that, more states have joined in on this effort, meaning more people have joined in, meaning we're gaining more observations. And the amount of data that we're gathering through these Atlas projects is just insane. Like I would not be able to do this. Even a small team of researchers would not be able to gather as much data without the help of community scientists. So we're really, really happy that these projects are bringing in so much information at a, and at a rapid rate, right? This would take more than a hundred years if I were to go out and try and gain 16,000 observations across 15 states. So when we look at the Midwest a little bit closer, um, <clears throat> you can see that there have been 18,000 observations 27 different species uh, and 1,600 bumblebee surveys by 348 different people. And you can see that Nebraska, Missouri, Minnesota, they have a little bit more observations and some more surveys, but they've also been running longer, right? The North Dakota, South Dakota, Kansas just started last year. I don't know if you remember your first year participating in the Atlas, but it's a year where you sort of find your bearings, you go out and do your surveys, and then year two is really when you hit the ground running. Um, we're excited that Iowa is going to be joining us this year, so that little gap will start to be filled. But looking back from where we started, um, Nebraska and Missouri, Nebraska started in 2019, Missouri started in 2020. You can see a map here on Bumblebee Watch that, you know, there were some incidental observations. There were a few people that knew about the website and were sharing their observations with us, but not very many, right? So we set out to sort of fill in this region where there is severely, like, there is a lack of bumblebee data in these states. So going out, providing training to people, getting them involved letting them know that we need help gathering bumblebee data and the importance of it. And now when we look to the end of the last season, so this is year four for Nebraska and year three for Missouri, you can see that those states are really starting to fill in without having the border there. You could kind of make out the shape of both of those states. So in Nebraska, they're at 6,631 bees documented and Missouri is almost at the 4,000 mark. So really, really exciting. Um, and thinking about the network of advocates that are submitting these is also so powerful, right? To have so many trained individuals out there that are knowledgeable now about the importance of bumblebees and can conduct surveys and you know tell their friends, tell their family about why pollinators are important is a really valuable aspect of the Atlas. So looking at some of the highlights, I'm going to start with Nebraska and then I'll move into Missouri. Um, <clears throat> on this grid map here of Nebraska, the darker grid cells mean that they, they have been surveyed each successive year. So those very dark blue grid cells on the eastern side of Nebraska have been surveyed every single year that the Atlas has happened. A majority of the cells have been surveyed three and four years. Um, there's only a couple on there that have only been surveyed once. And if you're from Nebraska, you know that those are very rural, hard to reach places in the state. Um, about 160 people have conducted a survey and there's probably more people that have conducted surveys. These are just 160 that have submitted a survey. So if you've gone out with your friends or your family, you know that tally mark is going to increase. And looking at a list of the bees that have come in, so 
There have been 13 unique bumblebee species. Historically, Nebraska has 20 species that have been documented. 96% um, of all of these observations by community scientists have been verified, which is really powerful, right? So when people are going out and taking photographs, that means that if we're able to verify those photographs down to a species level that you're taking really good pictures. 72% um, of these observations were recorded during a survey, meaning that for each one of the bees submitted, they also have associated habitat information. So we have an idea of what plants were in bloom, um, what the management practices were, what kind of habitat they were in, what kind of habitat was around them, so a little bit more detailed information about where that bee was collected. And the important part is that it has a measure of effort connected to it. So when we talk about measure of effort, we're able to take the surveys done throughout Nebraska and compare them to each other. But we're also able to take that and compare them atlas wide. So Pacific Northwest, California, North Dakota, South Dakota, Kansas, Minnesota, Missouri, Southeast, they're all conducting these same surveys, right? The 45 minute person surveys. So every bumblebee observation on a survey has that same measure of effort and can therefore be used in the same analysis. So really neat to sort of think about the scale at which this can be brought up or down. And then um, another exciting thing is the 90 new county records. So Bumblebee Atlas, Surveyors have been the first person to uh, bring in a new county record for 90 of those observations, which is really, really cool. You know, showing that we still have stuff to learn about species in our state. And for Nebraska, this, well, I guess last year, early last year, we released an identification guide using that bumblebee data that's been collected between 2019 and 2021. So three years of data went into making this spiral bound guide. Uh, it's really, really beautiful. If you are a Nebraska Bumblebee Atlas volunteer and you did not receive one of these guides, please reach out to me and I will get you a hard copy. Um, inside these guides, it has pictures of each of the species that have been observed historically in the state. So there are 20 profiles. There are identification features, um, color patterns, range maps, and some natural history and notes. There's also some sections on bumblebee anatomy, how to identify them, how to photograph. So we also have the top bumblebee plants by each ecoregion. And when I say top plants, I just mean that these are the plants that showed up most frequently in the bumblebee data set from the atlas. So not necessarily historical wise, this is just looking at atlas data. We also added a thank you in here to all of the volunteers. So anybody that conducted a survey, most of you that are on this call tonight from Nebraska, your name is very likely in this guidebook. Thank you for helping us out. Um, I cannot say that enough. This guide would not be possible without all of the data that you guys brought in in the past three years. So thank you again. Um, if you want one of these guidebooks, again, reach out to me. I have a huge stack of them here. Um, we also transformed the Nebraska data into habitat management guidelines for natural resource professionals, uh, land stewards, people that are actually working on the ground to make those decisions about supporting pollinators. So these guides go over grazing, prescribed fire, haying, mowing, invasive plant control, pesticide use, and then it has a little bit more information about bumblebee species, not very detailed, but just to give people an idea of what bees might be in their region and what some of the plants that they'll be utilizing. Um, my colleague Ray Powers and I also went around the state and worked with the Nature Conservancy, Prairie Plains Resource Institute, Northern Prairies Land Trust, Nebraska Game and Parks, to host habitat management workshops, again, for those people that are making decisions on the ground. So we talked about all of those practices that I just listed on the last page, how they can affect um, bumblebees and throughout different times of the year, and really just trying to provide them with the knowledge so that they can adapt their own practices if need be to support bumblebee populations. Of course, we also did a fun field portion, you know, where we go out and catch bumblebees and identify them. That's always everybody's favorite part. 
Um, looking at Missouri's results here, I have a map of the grid cells. Everywhere that you see a white box is where a habitat survey has been conducted, and all of the blue dots represent bumblebee observations. So in Missouri's three years of the atlas, there have been at least 189 people to submit a survey. They almost surpassed 4,000 bumblebee observations last year. Eight species out of their historical 10 have been detected, and they're at 484 surveys. So really, really nice work. Really good spatial distribution throughout the state. You can see there's a little, little tiny gap in the northern part and the southern part, but you know, that happens. So those same gaps exist in Nebraska, and you know, there's just some places that are harder to get to. Um, Missouri also had quite a few county records come in, in particular the Southern Plains bumblebee, which is a species of greatest conservation need in both Missouri and Nebraska. Um, this bee or this species was observed 67 different times in the last three years by 24 different people. So way to go, everybody that got to see one of these special bees. And 15 new county records have come in uh, each of the years. So there have been five in 2020, five in 2021, five in 2022. I hope we get five more in 2023 and five more in 2024. Um, you can see on the map here anywhere that is just blue, a county that is just blue with no black dots is a new county record. So an Atlas participant conducted a survey, found this bee in that county, and ended up being the first time that that bee had been recorded in that county. So really exciting. Um, it happened for a few other species, but I just wanted to pull out a few to show here. And looking at some of the native plants. So Bill White, who is recently retired from the Missouri Department of Conservation, took a deep dive into some of the plant data and put these slides together. Um, <clears throat> but he found that, so in Missouri, of all of the bumblebee observations, 80% of those plants were native. When we look at just the Southern Plains bumblebee, um, all of those 67 individuals were documented on a native plant. And the Southern Plains bumblebee was only found in an area where there was a diversity of native plants present. The most popular plants that this species was found on was partridge pea, gray-headed coneflower, and field thistle. Looking at the black and gold bumblebee, there were 228 individuals documented. 89% of them were recorded on a native plant and all of them were found where there was at least three other native plants in bloom. So really showing the importance of our native plants and Steve is gonna go into this um, at the end of the talk tonight, but black and gold bumblebee, um, its most popular plants were bee balm, wild indigo and field thistle. And lastly, just looking at the American bumblebee, there were 481 individuals documented in Missouri. 78% of them were recorded on a native plant, and almost 100% of them were, again, found where there was at least three other native plant species in bloom. Uh, this one was kind of interesting. 24% of individuals were found on thistle. So thistle is a very good late summer blooming plant that a lot of our bumblebees and wild bee species in general rely on. So if you can learn the difference between your native thistles and your non-native thistles, um, you know, start thinking about putting some in your yard if you can, or encouraging them not to be listed as a weed. You know, if these are native plants and they have a really, really good impact for our pollinator community, we need to utilize them a little bit more. Uh, I'm sure Steve will talk about these too. How can you not talk about thistles with bumblebees? Okay, so um, what's next? So in the beginning, you know, we had a large data gap in both of these states. And our goal was to engage people to participate in the project get some nice statewide information, um, learn how the bumblebees are interacting with the landscape. And you can see from the maps here that we have 
done that. There are a lot of volunteers. I think both Nebraska and Missouri have about 200 active volunteers right now. There are a few small gaps in each of these states, but uh, broadly speaking, they're both pretty well covered. They've been surveyed pretty well. So now it's time to take this information and start shifting towards a new goal. And this new focus is going to be looking at our target species. So in Nebraska, we're going to be focusing on the American bumblebee, Morrison's bumblebee, Southern Plains bumblebee, Suckley cuckoo bumblebee, variable cuckoo bumblebee, and the western bumblebee. Four of these are listed as a species of greatest conservation need in Nebraska, and then two of them, um, the American bumblebee was recently petitioned for endangered species status, and Morrison's bumblebee is experiencing decline in most of its range and is likely to be petitioned. So we're going to tack this one on just in case. Um, and in Missouri, we'll be focusing on the American bumblebee, the half black bumblebee, the Southern Plains bumblebee, and the yellow bumblebee. And so what we're gonna be doing with these at-risk species is conducting surveys in particular areas in hopes of finding them, right? So we have good statewide distribution data. We know sort of who the most abundant bee is, and we know that many of these species are not found in any abundance. We know that they're experiencing decline. So what we want to do starting in 2023 and moving forward is really focusing our target surveys on these species. So the way that we're going to do this is we're going to take our detections of at-risk species. So all the dots that you see on the map here are where an atlas participant has conducted a survey and found one of these species. So for the American bumblebee and the Southern Plains bumblebee, those were detected um, enough times in the atlas that we didn't have to bring in historical data. But for the Western bumblebee, Morrison bumblebee, Suckley's cuckoo bumblebee, vari variable cuckoo bumblebee, none of those species have been observed in the state since between 1999 and 2001. So we are using historical data to sort of figure out where we want to survey for those bees. So then we designed these target zones and these are essentially 10 kilometer polygons that take into account surrounding habitat of where that bumblebee observation occurred, where the bumblebee might go. And it also brings into account their dispersal rates. Um, so, you know, how far a bumblebee might travel and can they cross the habitat features that are in that area. So these target zones are where our highest chances of detecting each of the species are. And we're going to survey these in July and August. And I'll talk about this in a little bit longer too. So the survey season will still run from June to September but we're gonna focus on surveying in these target zones in July and August. And what that does is it allows us to focus in on detecting these at-risk species during the peak of bumblebee season, but at the tail ends in both June and September, it still allows us to find novel locations of other species and visit areas that maybe we haven't been to before. So this will be the same thing for Missouri. We've taken the detections of at-risk species. Again, this will be for the yellow bumblebee, half black bumblebee, Southern Plains bumblebee, and the American bumblebee, and created these 10 kilometer buffer zones around them. So these target zones that we're going to be focusing on. In both of the states, target zones exist in most of the grid cells, there are sometimes numerous target zones within a single grid cell. They're color-coded by species, so if you are a lister and you like to keep track of all the different organisms you've seen, you can consider, you know, going to a target zone to find a species you haven't seen before. Um, so how to participate in 2023 is very similar to how the Atlas has been running. Um, you're going to adopt your grid cell if you haven't already. And this the ask is still the same. So conducting at least two surveys anytime between June and September. 
the only new goal here, the new shift is that time shift. So in June, you survey the same way that you always have been, somewhere within your grid cell that you have permission to survey on. In July and August, we're going to focus on surveying in those target zones. So this can be a target zone within your grid cell. Um, it can be a target zone outside of your grid cell. It's up to you. Um, and then September, we're going to go back to surveying as you would normally. So conduct a survey anywhere within your grid cell that you have permission to. And then you submit your data to bumblebeewatch.org. When to survey is going to be the same as it has been um, anytime between June and September. The optimal weather conditions are between 60 and 90 degrees. Winds are less than 15 to 20 miles an hour. There's no rain. Um, there can be rain in the forecast, but no rain while you're surveying as that will bias the survey. Um, I find that the best time to survey is about 10 a.m., but not everybody has that luxury to do so. So anytime between 60 and 90 degrees, a survey is acceptable. We do have the updated grid maps that I'll show you here. Okay, permits. So I just kind of talked about these. Missouri, you don't need a permit, but if you're surveying on a Missouri Department of Conservation property, there is a volunteer agreement that you have to sign. When you adopt your grid cell, you should have a copy of that agreement come through. The agreement is also in the handbook and on the website. Um, but again, if you need help, just reach out to somebody on the call and we can get that to you. For Nebraska, you need a permit to survey on Nebraska Game and Parks property, and that includes things like state parks, state recreation areas, um, wildlife management areas. So if you want to get listed on that permit, please reach out to me and we will get that process rolling. Uh, Xerces now has permits for many of the national parks. So if you're interested in surveying in one of them, please reach out to bumblebeeatlas at xerces.org and we can sort of talk about what the guidelines are and rules for that and see if we can get you into one of those parks. For U.S. Forest Service, there are no permits needed, but please contact the appropriate district before you go out and survey. And this is mainly for safety reasons, right? If there's some sort of management taking place or maybe there's road closures, um, they just wanna be aware of who's going out to conduct surveys. Um, US Fish and Wildlife Service, we currently do not hold any permits to conduct surveys on these lands. So please don't go out there and survey unless you have obtained a permit from the service. I know people have in the past, so it's not impossible, but um, we don't have one right now. So just avoid those lands or make the appropriate contact. One more slide on precautions. Um, as a volunteer in the Atlas, we are not giving you property to go out on private land. Um, it's really a good idea if you can get permission from the landowner where you're going to conduct your surveys. If you can get that written just to cover all of your bases, um, because there is public land and private land that exists in all of the grid cells. So while you're there, you know, it's nice to have something like Avenza Maps or one of the apps that the hunting app, what's that hunting app? Onyx. There's some really nice apps out there today where you can sort of open up on your phone while you're in the field and see those property boundary lines. And just try to make sure that you stay on public land or if you're on private land, again, have that permission to be there. If it would increase your safety and comfort in the field while you're volunteering in some of these rural areas, um, we do provide volunteer badges. Um, we send these out once a year. So uh, we can send you a link if you'd like to request one of those badges. These are the same badges that we sent out last year. So if you would like one of these to carry into the field with you, uh, you're more than welcome to request one. If something were to happen in the field, there is a number on there that you can call that will go to one of the many Xerces Atlas coordinators and we can help uh, steer the conversation or offer advice. So now I just want to go into survey components really quickly um, and then I'm going to pass it over to Jared for some BID. 
But for any of you that are brand new to this, um, there are two components to a survey. So there's a bumblebee survey, which can either be a point survey or a roadside survey. And there is a habitat assessment. Um, the new, I guess, returning volunteers, we have a new bumblebee survey data sheet that has grids on it. And these are to incorporate some sort of scale to understand what size the bumblebees are in the field. So if you can download these new data sheets and start using those in the field, that would be great. Point surveys, these are the most common type of survey that people do and they're the pre preferred survey type. Um, to do a point survey, you're gonna select an area that's about two and a half acres within your grid cell. And you're going to actively look for bumblebees for 45 person minutes. So if there are three of you that are actively looking for bumblebees, your survey will only be 15 minutes. So you're taking 45 divided by the number of surveyors. At each point survey, you're going to do a bumblebee survey and a habitat assessment. And it's always good to plan a few locations for these just in case you show up to one and maybe the field was recently mowed or it was burned or for some reason there are no flowering resources, it's good to have another place that you can go to. Um, also make sure that somebody knows your plan, so where you're going, what time they should expect you back. Uh, just again to cover those bases, if something were to happen, it's nice to know that somebody else has an idea of where you are. 45 person minutes, when we say that, that means it is active search time. So we're going to pause the timer anytime you're transferring a bee to a vial, placing the bee in the cooler, taking notes, getting a sip of water. Anything that's not actively looking for bees does not count towards your 45 person minutes. Next one is a roadside survey. Um, <clears throat> I find myself doing a lot of roadside surveys during the summer, driving around, giving trainings in different places. I think they're kind of fun. Um, to do a roadside survey, you select a 10-mile stretch of road within your grid cell, and you're essentially conducting five mini-surveys within that 10-mile stretch. So on your 10 mile stretch, you're gonna pull over on the side of the road somewhere safe. It's a good idea to wear a safety vest if you have one. Um, if there's flowering resources there, you're gonna do a 15 person minute survey. You're gonna do a quick habitat assessment. You're gonna process your bees, release your bees, hop back in your vehicle and drive at least a half a mile down the road and stop at another patch of flowers, conduct a 15 minute person survey, do your quick habitat assessment, release your bees, and so on until you've done five mini surveys. Uh, the downside with roadside surveys is that roadsides tend to have a lot of non-native plants on them. And one of the goals of the Atlas is to understand how bumblebees are interacting with our native plants so that when we think about restoring habitat, we're able to put in those plants that they need throughout the season. So Roadsides are not the best for that, but, you know, they are a wonderful way to get by all the private lands, right? So in a lot of, let's say, Nebraska, there's a lot of private land here, and the roadsides are public to a certain degree if you stay on the boundary. And so this allows us to survey in some places where maybe we don't have access to public lands. Um, and some of the rural roadsides are they have tons of native plants. Um, so it, it all depends on where you are, but if you can't do a point survey, this is a really fun alternative. Um, again, definitely be aware of property boundaries when you do roadside surveys, um, respect any posted signs or regulations and make sure somebody knows your plan. If you are driving through rural areas, you're likely not gonna have service. So you know if you get a flat tire, make sure you've got a plan in mind. So following the bumblebee survey, whether you've done a point survey or a roadside survey, you're gonna do a habitat assessment. And these are not meant to be exhaustive assessments. It's just trying to get a snapshot of the survey area that you're in on that given day. 
So depending on the survey location and the surveyor themselves, this could take anywhere from five to 20 minutes. And you're just asked a series of questions that are taking note of the habitat that you're in, right? So what kinds of flowers are in bloom? What kinds of management practices are you seeing? What kinds of nesting features are there? And there are check boxes for each of these. So um, it'll kind of guide you in what information we're looking for. If this is your first year in the Atlas, I highly, highly recommend you watch this in-field instructional video. Um, unless you're able to attend an in-field training, then you don't need to worry about it. But this will sort of walk you through how to swing your net, how to place a bee in a vial, how to chill the bee, how to photograph the bee, everything that's very hard to explain via Zoom. Um, we created this field video to sort of show those techniques and walk you through them. So this is on YouTube. It's also on both the Nebraska website and the Missouri website. I think it's about 20, it's either 20 or 30 minutes. Okay, and then we'll just talk about supplies here really quickly. So there are four main things that you're gonna need, a net, some vials, a cooler, and a camera. Looking at nets, we like to use aerial insect nets. Um, and these are usually mesh that you can see through. They're more transparent than an opaque sweep net, if you've heard of sweep nets. So look for an aerial insect net. Um, I like to get mine through home science tools. They offer a student insect net that's about $15 or so. It has a nice wooden handle. The nets, um, mine's lasted, I think we're on year three, but they also have net replacements that you can get. There are many other net places that you can order from, so don't let that one sway you. Vials, uh, most of us use, probably have some right on my desk here, these little 30 to 50 milliliter vials. It's good to have about 20 of them on hand when you do a survey so that you have more than you need and don't have to stop your survey halfway through process your Vs in order to get more vials. So 30 to 50 milliliter is good. Some people will use even smaller ones like four dram. Um, if you want to use something bigger like a peanut butter jar, you're welcome to. These ones are just nice in terms of space. They're very light when you walk out into the field. Um, the plastic ones or the polyurethane ones chill the bees a lot faster than a glass vial does. So you can repurpose many items around your house to catch bugs in. Um, maybe it's been a while since you've thought about that, but lots of things can hold bugs. A cooler and crushed ice. So we like to use crushed ice for these and submerge the vial all the way up to the base of the cap. Um, definitely check your vials throughout the season to make sure that there are no hairline cracks in them because ice water will seep in and it's very hard to identify wet bees and it's not good for the bee. Um, what else was I gonna say about ice? Some of the newer high-tech ice packs are too cold for bumblebees. So if you do use those, place something in between the ice pack and the bee, whether that's a layer of ice or a towel or something, don't place the bee directly on the new ice packs. The older or more traditional style ice packs that are those blue frozen packs, you know, those ones don't really seem to chill the bee fast enough. So crushed ice is the, the nice medium there. It's not too cold and not too hot for an ice pack. I don't know if we can say an ice pack is too hot, but uh, crushed ice is the nice middle ground there. And then cameras. So the best type of camera for this would be a camera with a macro lens or a macro setting. Many people will use their smartphone and, you know, you can take good pictures there. You can also get clip-on macro lenses that are pretty affordable to take good pictures right from your smartphone still. Um, I use a point-and-shoot camera that has a nice macro lens on it. Some people will use DSLRs or a similar uh, Kind of whatever you want to use, whatever you're most comfortable with. Sometimes it takes practice in the field to find the right lighting and the right uh, resolution to make sure your photos are in focus when you're in the field. So now talking about photographing, 
um, your photos should include three different components of them, of the bee. So the first one is the head. We need to see the front of the face and the top of the head, and we'll be looking for color patterns of the hair. Uh, we'll also be looking at cheek length. We'll also be looking at the different lengths of the antennal segments, uh, where the simple eyes are or the ocelli. So these are not things that you will need to pay attention to, but just knowing that the front of the face holds a lot of identification features and understanding that we need a really, really good, clear photograph of the bee's face. You'll also wanna get a nice picture of the thorax. So looking top down from the bee is a good angle. So that allows us to see if there are any patterns a side or a profile view is also good. Again, looking at color patterns. Um, and then the last part is the abdomen. So the abdomen is split up into six different segments and each of those segments is called a tergite. So on the screen here, we have abbreviated tergite one to T1 all the way down to tergite six or T6, which is where you might see the stinger at the butt of the bee. And so each one of these abdominal segments can be a different color or have a color pattern on it. You know, maybe the color doesn't go all the way across the segment. Maybe it's only found in the center or maybe it's only found on the edges. So opening up those wings to get a nice photograph of the abdomen is very helpful in identifying. And while you're in the field, here's just a few tips to think about. Um, make sure that your photos are in focus while you're out there, because it would be really, really terrible to spend so much time planning and going out and conducting your survey and coming home to submit your data to find that all of your photographs are blurry, right? We can't identify blurry photos to species most times. And so while the data is still useful, we're sort of missing that component of what species were there. You know, there were bumblebees, but what species? So make sure your photographs are in focus when you're in the field. Take a second to look at the lighting. If it's too dark, find a different place. Similarly, if it's too light, you know, maybe move into the shade if possible or put a little piece of paper over while you take some photographs. Oftentimes you can increase or decrease the light or add contrast while you're at home, but it's easier to just get the good photo while you're in the field rather than having to adjust it at home. But maybe that's also a personal preference, who knows? Um, when you photograph the bee, it's a good idea to flip the bee on her back right away. So when you take the bee out of the ice, the bee will oftentimes sort of curl up into this concave shape which lifts her head off of the ground. So you can take a good photograph that shows the hair colors on the top of the head and the front of the face, the cheek length. You can get a lot of features in just one photo by flipping the bee on her back. Here are some examples of wet bees. So I said earlier, make sure to check your vials. Um, don't submerge the caps. Just take any necessary precautions to make sure that your bees are not getting wet. If your bee does happen to get wet, you can very gently take the edge of your shirt and sort of dry the bee off. Um, it might take them a little bit longer to wake up because they'll have to bathe themselves, but they should hopefully still fly off. But let's, let's try our best to not get the bees wet. It's very difficult to identify them. As you can see here, the color patterns just become matted. Um, opening the wings is something that will take a little bit of practice, but the bumblebee wings are not, they're not like butterflies. There's no scales that you're going to rub off. So you can gently open those wings up. Some people like to use the tip of a pen or a pencil or uh, forceps to open up the wings. However you do it uh, is okay. It's just very important to do so. Right, we need to see the color pattern underneath those wings. And if the wings are laying flat over the abdomen, it obscures a lot of what's going on in that section of the body. Okay, and then I'm gonna talk really quickly on submitting data, and then I promise I'm passing it over to Jared. So all of the data is submitted to bumblebeewatch.org. If you haven't set up an account yet, you'll need to do that first. It is free. 
you just create a username, submit your email, um, and then you can submit your Bumblebee data to that. Um, after a survey, please submit your data as close to the survey date as possible. And that's just to cover any basis of if there was something not filled out on your data sheet, but you didn't recognize it in the field, you're gonna have a hard time recalling the survey site the longer you wait. So if you can, enter your survey data close to the date that you actually surveyed. It's important to keep good record of which photos go with which B, because um, when you get home and you open up either your cell phone or you put your camera on your desktop and there's just 40 photographs of bees that all look very similar, it's hard to tell which was which. So either take note of the actual file number while you're in the field, um, People have gotten very creative in their ways of how they keep track of bees. Some people will write on the cap bee number one and have a picture of that cap in their photos. Uh, some people will bring a laminated sheet with them where they can sort of dry erase notes with the bee. So however you want to do it is totally okay with us. Just make sure you have a process for doing so. And then include only the most useful photos. So on our website, we have more guidance on this, but mostly what we're talking about here is that you can submit up to five photographs per bee. So try to include different angles of the bee. You know, if you have three photos of the face, we don't need all three of those, right? So try and include different angles of the bee, different parts of the bee, because the more that we can see, the easier it will be for us to identify. So just a quick note on submitting data here. I'm not gonna go through this whole process, but this is for both new and returning volunteers. So if you can stick with me for a few more minutes, when you submit your Bumblebee data, make sure that you're selecting the appropriate project. So if you are in Nebraska, you're gonna choose Nebraska Bumblebee Atlas. If you're in Missouri, you're gonna choose Missouri Bumblebee Atlas. Choosing this as your project allows you to submit your habitat data. Right, so everything that was on your habitat data assessment form is going to be prompted. The website knows that you have that form when you select this. If you are only submitting an incidental observation, you did not conduct a habitat survey, but you wanna share your bee photos, that is wonderful. And we love those, but those don't go under the Atlas. Those just go under Bumblebee Watch. So your project for an incidental sighting is Bumblebee Watch. When you're submitting habitat data, you're going to choose an atlas project. Um, after choosing the atlas project, the website is going to ask you a whole bunch of questions related to your habitat. And if you keep scrolling, there's going to be more about the plants you saw, your volunteer time, and when you're done with that, there's a button at the bottom that says save. If you did not observe any bumblebees and you scroll down and you click save, you are done. You do not have to enter any bumblebee photographs with that. Um, so here's the second step. Again, if you did not observe bumblebees and you're brought to this step and you see in the top corner there that green box that says checklist has been saved, that means we received your habitat data we understand that there are no bumblebees associated because you did not upload any bumblebees. So you don't have to upload a photo here that says no bees were observed. Um, we just know that on the back end. If you did observe bumblebees, you would continue going through this process, um, choose your files to upload, enter in your species, enter in your floral host, any notes you might have. And yeah, that's what I've got. So I will pass it over to Jared now and we can take a look at any questions. Uh, the female is going to have 12 antenna segments and the male is going to have 13. Uh, it depends on how you kind of count it out. Some people count this round knob here. Uh, I would not recommend trying to count this in the field. It's very, very hard. Pictures, it makes it way easier. But I will say this is, so when you're taking a picture of the front or the top of the head, um, doesn't always focus in very well. These are very, very small parts. So it's okay if you can't quite get a picture of that. It's not the end of the world. 
very helpful if you have a, a high quality camera though, and you can get um, a more defined kind of picture of the antennae. It's really, really helpful um, for us at least, but don't be discouraged if it won't, your camera won't focus in. It's a very kind of hard feature to pick up. Uh, secondary feature then, uh, so males will have really large eyes for a couple of species. Um, you kind of see, so female here, eyes are kind of inset almost, um, almost flush with the head, it kind of seems like. The males will get really, really bulgy. So they look really large, especially on like the top view of the head. They look alien. It's very strange. But um, that's one that when you get a picture, uh, maybe from the side profile or from the top of the head, um, it shows up really, really well in pictures. And then kind of went over already, um, stinger versus no stinger. So females will have a stinger, males will not. Um, generally, I wouldn't catch a bumblebee with my hand, but you can with the males, um, probably don't with the females. Uh, but in either way, the, the bee's goal is not to sting you. Um, it doesn't want to, it just wants to forage. Um, if you step on a nest, they might get aggressive. That's very, very rare and probably just won't happen. But overall, when you're handling the bees, you still want to be careful. Uh, but again, their goal is not to sting you, so you'll be okay. So from Missouri, um, kind of look like this. You got found eight last year. Historically, we have ten. Um, but the sheet will kind of look like this as a little guide for you. And then you'll get one of these um, as well. So this will kind of take you through um, the immediate steps of what you look for. And yeah, kind of like what we just went over. But in the field, it's very helpful. So if you need a checklist or mental checklist on how you kind of go down your list, um, it's very, very helpful for that. So again, just to kind of preface this, so three parts of the bee that we're really looking at. Um, the head, so the front of the head, kind of the face area, and then the top of the head. So sometimes it looks like eyebrows, but really stripe between where the thorax meets the head. Um, there'll be a little patch of hair that we're going to look for. Uh, and the thorax, so it's kind of the torso of the bee. It's where the wings attach, the legs attach. And there's going to be some color patterns that really split up um, kind of two main groups of bees that I, or the way I think about two main groups of bees. And then the abdomen again. So T1, T2, T3, T4, T5, T6, and T7 on the males. So our common eastern bumblebee. So this is pretty common, um, as the name implies. Uh, the head, the front of it, so the face is going to be black. Uh, top of it will be yellow. Should be pretty obvious in the pictures. And so the first three bees I'll talk about um, in terms of thorax pattern, they all sort of have a similar dot or a circle. Um, so kind of look like this, black circle surrounded by a bunch of yellow on the majority of the, the rest of the thorax. So for the common eastern, it tends to get kind of sparse. So the circle will look really, really big. I might end up turning into a kind of a teardrop. So you kind of see this turns into a little bit of a teardrop. So that's kind of the first giveaway, but really the main giveaway is gonna be T1 is the only um, abdominal segment that is yellow. So it does get a little dicey, um, especially if you're trying to go quick. So the first intel or the first abdominal segment kind of have almost like a suture down the middle line. So it looks kind of like a two spot, but there's no color on the second turga. So that's really what you're looking for is only yellow on the first, uh, nothing on the second, just black hairs on the second turga. Which will move us into our second bee. So our two spotted bumblebee, um, generally kind of the similar size as you'll see, um, common Eastern. Again, that thorax pattern that I was talking about, it'll have a dot in the center. Typically this one will be a bit of a smaller dot than the common Eastern, not necessarily a teardrop shape, but um, we'll just have that dot in the center. So that's kind of my first dead giveaway that it's one of the first three that I'm thinking about. And then T1, just like the common Eastern will be all yellow. And then T2 will have yellow on it. So this will separate it from the common Eastern um, if you see any amount of yellow on that second turga. And it looks, this is a great picture. So you can see it's kind of got this nice W shape, so two spots. It's a little bit variable depending on the B, but really what you're looking for is that there's two, two distinct humps or two dots and then it kind of cuts off. It doesn't go all the way to the edge here. Um, that's really, really indicative of the two spot bumblebee. And then T3 through six will all be black. This one I will say is a little bit of a note. You run into some male two spots, 
they get really wacky and it's very hard to ID them. But for the most part, you will see mainly the females um, of this. And this will move us into our next one. So the brown belted bumblebee, again, very, very common. Um, the top of the head, front of the head will be black uh, for females. Uh, again, it'll have that dot in the center of the thorax, surrounded by a bunch of yellow. And for the thorax, so this is a bee. So again, this is a picture from kind of the beginning. It's got this really nice buzz cut. So a lot of the brown belted are just very well kept. So it's kind of a secondary characteristic I'll look for. Um, it's just that it's really well kept, kind of a buzz cut almost on it. And then of course the brown belt. So you can see here, so T1, just like the other two will be all yellow. And T2 will have a really nice um, kind of a half circle shape. Won't necessarily go all the way back, but you can see in this picture, T2 probably ends about here. And this brown belt comes about halfway down that T2. This will go all the way to the edge of the turga. So contrary to the two spot, two spot will kind of end about here, uh, should be yellow, but the brown belt will go all the way back. Um, so some variants of the brown belt, instead of having brown, it'll be yellow, which kind of throw you off a little bit, but it can be yellow, can be brown. And then another thing to look for, so if the bee's a little bit older, uh, you'll, you'll get a lot of wing wear. So it's just um, hairs will kind of fall out, get rubbed off. That typically will happen along a center line. So you might have one that's, got a bunch of hair that's rubbed off right here. It looks more like a two spot. So what I'm really looking for is making sure that this uh, color goes all the way across, goes all the way to the side and doesn't end before that. Uh, and then again, so T3 through six will all be black. And it will kind of move us into our next grouping or well, actually a little note before that. So the males of this species um, tend to have really buggy eyes. That's kind of a giveaway for me, um, especially for this species more than probably the two spot in the common Eastern way more buggy than those two. But that's something to look out for. If you think you have a male, um, the legs look like probably no corbicula, you think it's a male, double check the eyes, if they're really bulgy on top, you know you have a male. So yes, yeah, Southern Plains. So this is one of our uh, Missouri's target species that we're looking for. This is kind of where the, the circle on the, on the thorax kind of ends and you know, where the big pattern shift happens. So for this one specifically, uh, because we're starting with the head, black head um, on the face and on the top will both be black. Now when it comes to the thorax, typically it looks like a stripe between the wings. So it's this really nice stripe, nice band right between the wings. Uh, rest of the thorax is gonna be this nice yellow color, go under the wings, kind of circle all the way around the back. And generally as, just as a whole, this bee looks kind of like the brown belt in that all the hair looks very, very well kept. It looks very buzz cut, um, just all the way across. And then T1 is yellow, T2 is yellow, and then it's black all the way after that. So on the abdomen then, what we're looking at, this hair, you can tell it looks kind of buzz cut. So generally um, the other bees won't look kind of like this, but these are all laid really, really flat. So. This bee typically when you see it in the field is you kind of know it off the bat. It looks, granted it is rare, so you might not be thinking about it, but um, when you see it, it's very, very obvious that the hairs are laid back. Only T1 and T2 are yellow and just kind of looks generally buzz cut. But these are very, very cool. I hope you guys find one this, this summer. Uh, so another species of concern that we're looking at is the American bumblebee. So again, this one does not have the circle in the center. Um, it doesn't have quite a defined band like the Southern Plains. So the top half, top third, I guess, um, of the thorax will be this nice yellow and the middle third will be black. And then the last third will be kind of variable. Typically it's yellow, medium yellow. Um, it's not always, it's not the best defining characteristic, but as long as you don't see a circle, you can know that it's probably not one of the first three I talked about. Um, T1 is gonna be half yellow, half black. So it, the, the last half, the half closest to T2 will have this nice yellow on it. Um, this is typically one of the easier characteristics um, that I'll look for when we get these pictures. So especially if you think you have a, an American, make sure to get a really, really clear shot of the abdomen. 
And um, you want to see that it go all the way across. So there's a couple, there's one other species that will have yellow here, but no yellow in the middle. So it's really, really important that we get a full clean shot of this. But you'll have um, T1 will have some yellow on it, T2 and 3 will be yellow, and then T4 through 6 will all be black. But the main thing you want to really take a picture of here is the top of the head. Um, the front of the head, you want it to be black, and the very, very top. So the kind of eyebrow area that we kind of coined the term for, a lot of volunteers use that. Works great. It looks very obvious when you see it. Um, the top will be black. So that's what you really want. If you think you have an American bumblebee, make sure to get at least one or two pictures of the, of the face and the top of the head. Um, a couple angles would be really, really helpful for that. So in this, and we contrast this one with the black and golds, this is why it's so important to get these good pictures of these two, because um, these two look very similar in shape and size. So again, thorax, kind of the same pattern, not going to have a circle on it. Um, it'll have a little bit of yellow on the top third, a little bit on the bottom third. Middle third will be black. Um, abdomen. So this one, for sure, not. Um, you don't typically see any yellow on it. This is one where the, the corners on some will be a little bit yellow. So this is another one where it's really, really important. Get a clean shot of the full abdomen. Um, T2 will be yellow. T3 will be yellow. And the rest will be black. But for this one especially, um, again, it's going to be the head and the face. So the face will be all black, and the top of the head will have some yellow on it. This kind of varies. It can be really, really hard to see. Um, it can be really confusing if it's got a lot of pollen on it too. But what this looks like, kind of looks like, uh, kind of look, look like these eyebrows almost. So black and gold will have this really, really nice. This is a great picture. It's a great specimen. Um, really nice, big gold eyebrow looking things. Contrasted with the American here on the right, where it's just black. This is really the most important one. I cannot stress this enough. It's so hard when there's a iffy picture of the head. But if you think you have a black and gold or an American, just try to get at least one or two really clean pictures of the top of the head. That was really, really helpful um, when it comes to IDing these. Yeah, and again, the band. So this is the American goes all the way across. Um, black and gold might have a little bit here, but then the rest of this will be black. Um, makes it really hard. Again, the top of the head is really what I'm hoping for. So the yellow bumblebee, another target species um, for Missouri. Don't see these um, hardly at all, really. These are really, really uncommon for us. Probably more common in the North Missouri area, maybe a little bit West. I think that's where we saw it last year, maybe. But the uh, front of the head's gonna be black, top of the head's gonna be black. Um, typically, just as a whole, this will just look really, really golden. Um, when you see it in the field, it's kind of stunning. But uh, the thorax, so it's gonna have yellow in front of the wings, a narrow band in the middle. So it kind of looks similar to the Southern Plains, but this is generally a little thinner. Um, and then yellow behind the wings. So right here is what we're looking for for the yellow bumblebee. You can get a picture of this where maybe the wings are laid back where you have a really good side profile. This is really what we're looking for um, for this picture, at least for the thorax picture. And then the abdomen, uh, T1 through 4 are going to be yellow and T5 and 6 are going to be black. So that's what, if it, as long as it's a female, if you know it's a female, there is very little else it could be, especially for Missouri. Uh, if we see this much yellow on a female bee, it's, you kind of know right away you got something special. Uh, in terms of males, hopefully you won't run into it, but the male um, yellow bumblebee and the male um, male American bumblebee look very, very similar. We'll probably cover differences later on in the year uh, when it kind of gets closer to that and do a bee workshop. Uh, but if you think you have a male yellow or a male American bumblebee, make sure to take a lot of pictures. Just get as many clean, good pictures as you can. You know, really focus on under the wing and then all of the abdomen, get every segment of the abdomen. Uh, last one we'll kind of cover, I think this is the last one I cover, um, the half black bumblebee. Similar to the, the yellow bumblebee, not very common. Don't see too many of these um, in Missouri. Again, maybe more north is probably more common, um, but the front of the face is gonna be black. Top of the head is gonna be yellow. Um, this is gonna be, the yellow or the, the circle kind of pattern that we talked about with the first three. I've got the nice circle in the middle and surrounded by yellow on the rest of the thorax. 
and then T1 and T2 are going to be the only things that are yellow on this one. So T3 through 6 will be black. And if you can kind of see here, maybe looks like a two spot, but it really goes all the way across. So again, the two spot will end about here. You'll see a nice W shape. And you'll have, um, as, a, as a whole, this is probably the least well kept. So it'll have long, uneven hair. Uh, generally, kind of a smaller bee. It's really strange to see it. Um, don't see it very often in Missouri when you do. I don't know, it just looks real shaggy, even as a female. But uh, very fun to find them. Uh, very cool. But really what you're looking for is just the first two turga being really yellow and just uniform yellow across um, T2 here. I think with that, I can stop sharing, I believe, Katie. Do you have the rest of the bumblebees on that slide? I do. Yeah. Do you mind just clicking through so we don't have to switch screens again? I think that should work. Okay. Maybe. Is that right? You. Yep. That, that's good. Yeah. Cool. So we're just going to cover a few more for those of you in Nebraska. This is mostly going to be for western Nebraska, a little bit into the Sand Hills area. All the bees that Jared covered are in Nebraska as well. Um, so here we have the Hunts bumblebee. This is a really beautiful red-tailed bee if you've gotten a chance to see it. It's pretty common out west. Um, it has a pretty consistent color pattern too, which is nice, meaning we don't see a lot of variability in this color pattern, which is always just so lovely when that happens. Um, it's got yellow hairs on the front of the face and the top of the head. There's a nice black band in between the wings. And that thorax, or not the thorax, the abdomen, is always going to have the first tergite be yellow, the second and third ones are orange, the fourth one is yellow, and the last two are black. So if you see that color combo on the abdomen with a yellow face, you've got a Hunt's bumblebee. I just tried to click my keyboard. Can you go to the next one? Thank you. And um, then we've got the Nevada bumblebee or Bombus nevadensis. This is a really big, chunky bumblebee species. Um, I always find that these ones are quite curious when I'm surveying. They like to come and check you out and see what you're doing. And if they could, they might ask why you're trying to catch them in a net. Um, but they're relatively big species. They've got a nice black circle on their thorax that is otherwise yellow. And then T1 through T3 are typically yellow. Sometimes T1 has a little bit of black mixed in it. And then T4 through 6 are black. Next, Morrison bumblebee. This one is not common in our state. This is a target species though. Um, it is declining throughout much of its range and it's very likely that it will be petitioned in the next couple of years. So because of that, we're just gonna add it to our target species. Um, this one is associated with drier areas. So if you're out, you know, way out west near Toadstool or somewhere where it's more arid and shrubby-like, you might have an opportunity to observe this. Somebody did find this bee, I think it was in 2018, there was an observation, it might have been 2017, that came up on iNaturalist. So it does still exist in the state. Um, it would be really cool if we could detect it again because it's been a few years. If you see a huge bee that has no black on the thorax, then you've got the Morrison bumblebee, it would be really exciting. So keep your eyes out if you go out west. Next slide. The Western bumblebee, this is another one of the target species for Nebraska. It is one of Nebraska's species of greatest conservation need. Um, this species, is actually, its ruling is due out as to whether or not it will be listed under the Endangered Species Act pretty soon, we should be hearing. Um, if you find a bee that's got a white tail to it when you're out in the northwest part of the state, you've got the western bumblebee, though this species hasn't been detected in Nebraska since 2001. Um, despite our efforts in the atlas, we had a group of volunteers that signed up to go specifically look for this bee in some of its historical locations. Um, I think the team of nine volunteers conducted something like 
80 surveys and came back with about 400 bee observations. So we put in some good effort, but we're unable to actually detect it. So that effort is still valuable though. It lets us know that we did look in those historical locations, but didn't come up with it. That doesn't mean it's not there. Somebody else could find it. There's always a chance. But the telltale giveaway for this species is that white tail on the abdomen. Next slide. Suckley cuckoo bumblebee. Um, this one again hasn't been seen in the state since 1999. And before that, there have only been a few observations in the state, anyways. Um, the picture of the pinned specimen up there is a historic one collected in Lincoln in August of 1992. 93. You can take your guess on that. Um, pretty cool to see that old of a specimen still be well preserved and kept in there. Um, this is a cuckoo bee. So this one, if you do find a cuckoo bee, it will look a little bit like it's balding or the hairs are more sparse. It's not hairy throughout the body. It looks otherwise like a regular bumblebee, but something's just a little bit off about it. This one, if if it is going to come up in one of our surveys, um, usually peaks in August and September would be the prime time to go look for that bee. But if you know it's the host or it hosts on the western bumblebee, so when it goes to parasitize a nest, it's going to be seeking out the western bumblebee. So there's a connection there between the decline of these two species, right? If the host species is declining, then the parasite species will decline with it. Next slide. The variable cuckoo bumblebee. Um, this is one of North America's rarest bumblebees. I don't think it's been observed. Don't quote me on this, but I don't think it's been observed in the last 10 years or so. And beyond that, it's only been observed a few times in the early 2000s. It hasn't been seen in Nebraska since 1999. Um, it's never been common, but it's been around, though it's obviously declined a lot more than it was historically. Uh, this bee is mostly black on the abdomen, though on the males there can be some yellow, and even on the females. I think there's a little bit of yellow on the, maybe not. I have not seen one of these, um, but it's the variabilis, variable cuckoo bumblebee, mostly because of the males, because like Jared was saying, with the two-spotted bumblebees, the males can get a bit wacky and have yellow all over the abdomen. Um, this species, I saw Cynthia asked a question about when they peak, and it is outside of our target zone of being July and August. The species usually peaks in September and October, but that is based off of the very few records that we know of. And the other cuckoo bees tend to come out in August and September. So hopefully, you know, if somebody is serving in one of those areas and this bee is present, we'll be able to detect it. But again, it's been more than 20 years since we've seen it. So we'll see what our chances are. Next slide. And resources. So we covered some of the common ones and our target species tonight, but if you want to know more about bumblebees, um, if you're in Nebraska, you can look at the new guidebook. And if you are a Nebraska volunteer and you didn't receive a guidebook, definitely reach out to me and I can get one to you. Um, bumblebees of North America is a really great resource. There are free identification guides in the top left corner on the screen there that you see, the bumblebees of Eastern United States and Western United States. Those are good resources that you can find online. Um, Missouri has another bumblebee guide, and then you can also use the Bumblebee Watch app or desktop platform to help you figure out what kind of bees you have by clicking on different features. All right, go team. Now we'll pass it over to Steve, who can end tonight with some plant data, and then we can take a few minutes to go over all the questions.
All right, everybody hear me and see the screen okay? All yep, right. it looks good. Excellent, so I'm just gonna go over the top 10 plants that we collected bumblebees on over the last several years, talk about some ID issues with some of the plants and maybe just a refresher on uh, what we're looking at out there and some of the common hangups with identifications. So here's what that data looks like um, in terms of the blue bars being the total number of collections and the orange being the number of species. So, you know, the first thing you could take from this is if you're looking for diversity, it may not be the same as if you're just targeting abundance. So clovers um, are far and away the most visited genus of plants here, but only five species visit them as opposed to salvias, where we got seven different species visiting them, but far less frequently. So as we're planning out our surveys, it's important to keep an eye on some of the less common plants. And this new study that came out just this February um, was looking at the diets of three rare species. This is from Ohio, but it holds pretty well here, of vegans, um, of the half black bumblebee, the Great Plains bumblebee, the Southern Great Plains bumblebee, and the American bumblebee, saying that the, their floral preferences are kind of different than the bulk of the species. So a lot of the plants we're going to talk about today are preferred by rare bees, but some of the other ones, like the goldenrods, the milkweeds, um, were actually visited far less often by the target species um, than would be expected just if everything was equal. So as we go through the slides of the plants, I'm gonna have a green star on the plants that are preferentially visited by those rare bees. As we're out and about, you know, it's important to kind of look around at the landscape. And if you see patches of the preferential species, uh, those would be really good targets to watch for bumblebees, especially to get the target species. So one of the best plants out there is bee balm. Uh, we only have, we have two different species of bee balm in Missouri. Uh, the woodland bee balm is blooming in peak right now. The queens are gorging on it in the woods. But the most common one that we collect bumblebees on over the course of the summer is the prairie species, wild bergamot or prairie bee balm. Um, so this one gets the star. This is preferentially visited by a lot of our rare species. But um, there's also recent work coming out that the common name bee balm um, is actually pretty true. You know, it's one of these old, old names that follows the plant, but there's actually medicinal uses for bumblebees from bee balm. And basically different plants of Monarda fistulosa produce different chemicals. And once you're done reading all this, let me know. But they produce different chemicals and those chemicals are more or less effective at fighting crithidia, one of the major diseases uh, on bumblebees. So, when you're surveying on bee balm, it could be important to try out different patches of bee balm within your two and a half acre survey site because the chemical variation uh, occurs plant to plant within this species. So if you're not seeing good bumblebee activity on one patch, try a different patch. Maybe it has a different chemical phenotype that uh, the bees are actually preferentially visiting to help treat or to help reduce the crithidia load. Um, so bee balms in the mint family, I should point out, square stems, opposite leaves, but those pink, big pink floral heads are unmistakable on the landscape. There's really nothing else like that. 433 observations of nearly the full diversity of Missouri bumblebees on this species. Uh, the next most visited plant was clovers, trifolium. Um, now this is the probably most visited exotic plant. And the big red clover you're seeing here is trifolium pretense. Um, red field or field clover or red clover. And this one is actually preferentially visited by, again, by the rare bumblebee species. And a lot of this has to do with the length of the floral tubes. So if you think about the white clover that grows in your yards, um, you know, it has very short floral tubes and all the short tongue bumblebees can get in there. But trifolium pretense, uh, red clover locks its nectar away a little bit deeper. So it's a little bit more selective about who visits. And thus, um, you know, kind of draws in those rare species. So 317 observations of four species. Um, clovers are pretty familiar to us, but they're in the bean family. They have the three-parted leaves. And they're not all exotic, uh, is one good thing to point out. Um, this guy here is running buffalo clover. It was formerly federally listed and is fairly common in Missouri. 
Um, it's pretty technical to tell it from the common white clover that grows in your yards. But just be aware that there are a few native members of this genus, but they're not out there very common. The two you're going to uncover or encounter are red clover, Trifolium praetens, and this white clover, um, which is a hybrid aesthetic. Um, so the third most common plant we're likely to encounter, and one that it came up several times in this talk already, are the thistles. Um, thistles are one that you know are great for bees and butterflies. We've got six different species of bumblebees using um, using thistles 223 times. Um, and as we go through these surveys, it's really important for us to note if the thistles that you're surveying on are native or exotic. And without getting too down in the weeds in a botany presentation here, um, there's one really simple character you can use to determine if your thistles are native or exotic for most of Missouri. And that's to look at the underside of the leaves. So if you flip over a leaf on the native thistles, they'll be white on the undersides of the leaves. Um, they're also just friendlier plants. You can handle the leaves, you can handle the flower heads, um, and they don't cause you any real harm. Uh, almost all the exotic ones, if you grab that flower head, you'll regret it later. There's differences in bloom time. The exotics tend to bloom um, July and August, whereas most of the native thistles will be kind of the tail end of August into September, even through October. And uh, you almost never see just pure patches of the native thistles. You might see a field that has 20 or 30 stems, but you'll never see that old fallow field that's completely overrun with a deep purple in the middle of summer. Those are going to be your exotic thistles. Um, so making those notes on your field sheets can be really helpful um, for helping, letting us know that uh, the flora resources out there are part of, you know, part of the natural flora. And that's probably better beneficial for the bumblebees as well. So blazing stars, genus Liatris is another uh, top draw. So this one is an interesting one because um, we think of it as being a really good pollinator plant, but in the Ohio study referenced earlier, they actually saw lower visitation rates for most of the target species on Liatris as opposed to most of the other plants that we're looking at. So this one probably tend to have more of the common bumblebee species. Uh, five species recorded in Missouri, 195 different observations. And the two pictured here are going to be the two most common uh, blazing star species you're going to see. The one on your left that has kind of the continuous spike of flowers is the true prairie species, um, ranging from kind of mesic to wet prairies. This is Liatris pycnostachia, or prairie blazing star. The one on the right, you can see those flower heads are much more discreet. Um, you know, even from a distance, you can pick out that, you know, there's maybe 40 different ray flowers in that, each of those heads. And you see that they're separated along the stalk. And this is Liatris aspera, or rough blazing star. Um, rough blazing star in Missouri occurs on roadsides, on glades. Um, really, it's more of a survival type plant. Uh, Liatris pycnostachia, the prairie blazing star, is more than happy to kind of compete with the big grasses in the middle of the prairie. But um, rough blazing star is going to be found in more open spaces, more barren, um, kind of early successional habitats. Um, but these are the two most common. Blazing star species, if you start, if you survey on glades, you're going to get into some special species um, that may or may not get different usage. It'd be good to know. All right, so the milkweeds are another interesting one. It's one we always kind of look for. We feel like they're really good pollinator plants. But again, our target suite of species did not preferentially or, you know, kind of visited milkweeds less than would be expected um, based on on just the, the numbers. If they were, weren't showing any preference, they would have seen more visits to milkweeds. Um, you can almost just barely see the bloom of the purple milkweed on the left there behind the great spangled fritillaries. And on the right is uh, world milkweed, um, which is a colonial milkweed. So you often, when you find this one, you'll find a large patch of it, um, you know, maybe 100, 300 stems growing in it. Um, similar to how the common milkweed is colonial, spreads by underground rhizomes, so does world milkweed. Uh, I didn't include a picture of the common milkweed. It's probably one most people are familiar with. But, you know, you should know that there's probably 14 different species of milkweed in the state of Missouri. And milkweeds um, are a good one to target because milkweeds uh, lock their pollen in a special pollinia that actually requires a large insect, like a great sprangled fritillary or a 
a large bumblebee to actually dislodge that flenia from the flower. If you closely examine um, milkweed flowers, you can often find uh, honeybee legs that uh, they got their leg trapped into the flenia, but they were not strong enough to remove it. And so they just leave the leg behind and you try to carry on with their lives. Um, so a plant that needs the bumblebees as much as uh, the bumblebees may need the plant. Ooh, that is terribly out of focus. But another really common one is uh, Sclepius tuberosa, um, the butterfly milkweed. This is a plant that is naturally a prairie and glade species, but also will thrive on roadsides. And uh, that distinctive orange um, is unlike any other milkweed in the state. So the more specific we can be, the better we can try to track down some of these floral preferences over time and make sure we're providing the right habitats in the right places. Uh, Shoshoe partridge pea um, is a really kind of ruderal species in Missouri. So this one you'll often find in uh, CRP and plantings. Um, in you know, native situations, it's pretty uncommon. But especially in restored prairies, it can be quite common. Uh, this species is actually one of the rare benefactors as a native annual uh, in our systems because it's evolved the ability to use the same rhizobacteria as soybeans. So often when we are doing a prairie restoration, we'll plant soybeans and then plant our seed mix. And as a result, uh, showy partridge pea will come up in droves because it already has the bacterial community it needs to thrive. Um, this one doesn't support as wide of a diversity of species, only five different species of bumblebees of the, on this one, um, but 145 total observations. So still a good one to keep your eye on. Um, an interesting note about this one too is that in contrast to most of these plants which produce their nectar in the flowers, showy partridge pea often produces extra floral nectaries which are tended by ants. And so you'll often see bumblebees kind of working the outsides of the flowers, um, acting more like one of those notorious Robert Carpenter bees instead of a good pollinator. Um, so goldenrods are extremely diverse within the state. We've got 23 different species of goldenrods. Um, again, not generally used by um, some of the target species here, some of the focal species, but still good numbers and good diversity on them. Um, they occur in every habitat, and sometimes IDing, especially the woodland species, can be pretty tricky. But the tall goldenrod or the Canada goldenrod is the one you're most likely to encounter. It um, grows in old fields and prairies, and it's a colonial species. So when you find, you know, one stem of it, you're as likely to find a thousand stems of it. And, you know, when you get that many stems, you're bound to get some vegetation. Another thing to watch out for are oil beetles. These maloes um, are actually bee parasites. Their larva, um, or they climb up to the top of these twigs, these stems, and mimic, um, mimic bees, and then they hitch a ride with the bee back to their nest. Um, so goldenrods, again, are a late season thing. Um, so these would be a good target if you're looking out for the late colonies of Bombus pennsylvanicus on the landscape. Sunflowers, um, again, really diverse, 16 different species of sunflowers in Missouri. Um, when we think of sunflowers, we may think of the giant headed ones that are grown agriculturally, um, but the vast majority, well, actually all our native species, um, look far more like the Jerusalem artichoke you see on the right. Um, sunflowers support a wide range of native bees, but only four species of uh, bumblebees noted in our study. But in Ohio, they found they were preferentially visited by a lot of our target species. So they're probably a group of flowers to take a good look at. Um, one thing I did want to note is, again, that the sunflower pollen has been shown, uh, those spiky structures you see there, have actually been shown to have uh, helped the bees rid themselves of Crithidia bombii. So when bees visit sunflowers, they um, could be self-medicating. It's a thing to keep an eye out for. I do want to make a note and make sure that when we're talking about sunflowers, we're actually talking about sunflowers because there are a big genus of lookalikes um, called the rosin weeds, or the silphiums. And so there's a couple different characters we can use to tell a rosin weed from a sunflower. Um, so the one on the left is the rosin weed. 
And uh, the best character, if you have, have it in flower without getting down into the details again of the floral structures, is to look at the involucal brax, which this grasshopper is resting his hind leg on. In silphiums, they're big and broadly triangular. They're wider or as wide as they are long. Whereas in all of our native sunflowers, I tried to cut this out so you could see them, but they're much longer than they are wide. Um, so that's pretty good character for silphium versus uh, helianthus, true sunflowers. Uh, silphiums also have a very sandpapery leaf. They're so rough that you can't rub your thumb against it. It's like handling sandpaper. Sunflowers will often have rough leaves, but you can still move your fingers against it without removing your fingerprints. Um, a third character for telling silphiums from sunflowers is the common name. So their common name is rosin weeds. If you break a leaf off of any of the silphiums, and that includes rosin weed and prairie dock and compass plant, they all have a, a milky sap um, that historically was used as chewing gum, but none of our sunflowers have that milky sap. So as you're surveying, you know, if you find you're on a yellow composite like this, you know, it is kind of bewildering. There's a lot of diversity out there. But if we can at least try to dif differentiate the rosin weeds from the true sunflowers, um, that'll help uh, pin our data down and make it as good as it can be. And then last, but certainly not least, are the asters. Um, 24 species of asters in the state of Missouri, inhabiting, you know, every every inch of possible or every ecosystem within the state from swamps to prairies, um, ranging from, you know, the little white ones, which are extremely common, the white heath and white wreath aster, you know, to our big purple New England asters. Um, getting down into the details of these is probably not important, but what is important is that you realize that almost all of our asters are fall blooming, uh, September and October. If you see little white daisy type flowers out now, um, what you're actually sampling is daisy fleabane. Um, the florets of flor flowers of that are remarkably similar to, um, to the true asters, but the timing alone is enough that, you know, if you're sampling for your June sampling on little white daisy flowers, it's probably a daisy fleabane um, erigeron and not a true aster. So just an important distinction that I want to get in before we Move on to the last and probably weediest of all of our target species here, and that is the tick seeds. So if you've ever come home from a hike in the fall or over the winter and your um, socks are full of needles, that's almost certainly tick seeds. So almost all of our species are annuals. Um, they'll occupy the open spaces in a prairie, but probably their true habitat is you know wetland edges where the watery seeds um, now they're really found on roadsides and in kind of any place that has a lot of disturbance. Um, but they are, you know, remarkably attractive to these bumblebees, four species with 100 observations. Um, there's 11 species of Bidens in the state of Missouri, but really if we assume most of them are Bidens aristosa, um, the common one, you probably won't go astray unless you're sampling in some really rare habitats. Um, so Bidens, as opposed to the sunflowers, have finely dissected leaves. I probably should have worked a little harder to make sure that was visible in this photo, but at the top you can see some of the really deeply lobed leaves, and none of our sunflowers um, have lobed leaves like that. Um, so they're, they're really quite distinct. And that is a quick run through of the plants to try to keep us on time. You did perfect. Thank you. Um, so it is 730. If you do have to jump off, thank you for being here tonight. Um, if you have any questions as the survey season gets going, you can reach out to any of us on this call. We'll be happy to answer your questions. We are planning field events. So if you want to come out and learn how to swing nets and catch and identify bees, there will be four events in Missouri and four events in Nebraska. So we'll post those to the Facebook pages. Um, if you're not already in there, we have a regional group for the Midwest, which I'll post in the chat. And then we also have groups for um, each of the states. So if you have a few more minutes, you can stick around and we'll answer the questions. Um, otherwise, thanks so much for being here.
I saw one of the questions that was in here. Somebody asked about if you're a first time volunteer, is there an opportunity to go into the field with a more experienced volunteer? And to that, I would say join one of these Facebook groups that I'm putting in the chat. Um, it's a good place for volunteers to connect with each other. You can set up a survey date in there. Um, from behind the scenes of the Atlas, we're not allowed to share your email addresses with other people, but certainly if you want to connect on the internet, you're free to do that. Um, let's look through some of these other questions. When doing a survey solo, is there a maximum amount of time the earliest bee caught can stay on ice? So the bees will be okay during the duration of your survey. Even if your survey ends up going an hour and a half, two hours, the bees will be okay. If it's a really hot day, um, you probably want to stop your survey if it is going long. Process what you have halfway through release those bees, and then carry on your active search time. Um, but generally speaking, if you go out and survey between 60 and 90 degrees, your bees should be okay on ice for that time period. Um, I want to make a note on behalf of the Missouri Prairie Foundation. If you do survey their properties, please get in touch with one of them so that they know that you're out there as well. And I will work to get contact information for them up on our website and in the handbook so it's more accessible. Um, Steve, someone here is asking a question. With some clovers being non-native, I have considered removing them from my prairie. Would you discourage this due to the fact that bees favor them? You wanna provide some input there? Yeah, that's a good question and, and kind of a tricky one to answer. And it kind of depends on what your prairie is. If we are managing a native prairie, then the clovers are going to go, um, encouraging only native plants. If it's a restored prairie, a CRP planting, something you've seeded in, and it's not overwhelming, and you want to leave it for the bees, um, I really kind of see that as a matter of personal preference. Um, and on my own space I leave clovers for the bees but at work I do not so there's no right answer there all right um a few people have talked about early blooming plants such as baptisia or wild indigo and observing bumblebees on them but it falls outside of the survey window when you see a bee in May and those observations are really important and wonderful if you want to upload them to Bumblebee Watch, um, but they're not included in the Atlas surveys because when we're going out and handling bumblebees, we're trying to avoid handling the queens because the queen phase is a very sensitive phase of the life cycle. And so we want those queens to be able to establish a nest, get their workers out, and then we're conducting our surveys. So if you see a bee in March, April, May, you can definitely take a photo of it, upload that to Bumblebee Watch, and that data will be used. It's just not when we're targeting our surveys. Somebody else also mentioned iNaturalist as a way to identify plants. Um, that is a great tool if you're unsure of the plants in your area. It's pretty good at using artificial intelligence to make a best guess based on your picture and your location of what the plant might be. If you are in the field and you don't know what the plant is, you can also consider getting a guidebook fit for your area that will talk about the flowering plants. You can also post pictures of unknown plants in the Facebook group, and I can almost guarantee that somebody in that group will know what it is. Um, there's a few other apps too that are good with identifying plants. Let's see, today's presentation, so half of it was recorded. I will re record the first half and send it out as one presentation when it's all done. Uh, that will be shared via email. So if you registered for this webinar, you will get the link when it's done. Lillian is asking about how to find a target zone in the grid cells. So if you go to 
the Missouri or Nebraska Bumblebee Atlas websites, you can find the Adopt a Grid Cell. And on there, you'll see the interactive map that has the grids and the target zone. So you can zoom in and out of your grid cell. You can type in a location if that's easier. And you can just sort of look to see what target zones are near you and where you might want to survey. I think that answered all of our questions. Jenny was answering a lot of questions behind the scenes. So if you asked a question and you didn't hear it, open the Q&A box and you can pan over to the answered tab and you can see your question and a response that she might have given. Okay, well, if there are no more questions, we can sign off. Um, thank you for spending the evening with us. I hope you all have a great survey season. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. We are here to help. Oh, one more question. The habitat assessment did not change. The habitat assessment is the same this year.